let you know that the garden you're seeing right here, which is my backyard, started in 2004 when I retired. At that time, Terry gave me a certificate from the National Wildlife Federation that certified our backyard as a wildlife habitat. That's when I got the signal and learned to combine gardening with my birding. So what I started doing was building the garden that I'll show you as we step through the backyard and how it came about since 2004. Then we'll go out to my new extended garden which opened up in 2015 where we purchased the lot behind us and I just expanded my backyard to a new level. Okay. So if you like, uh, why don't we start with how I feed birds and bring them in close and then we can come down and take a casual walk through the garden. Sounds great. Okay. One of the things that we really lucked out on is when we bought the house, there's two stories on the back. When we added this sunroom and this deck, it opened us up to a two-story level venture okay. inside trees. So a lot of the shrubbery you see along the back of the yard has been here since we've lived here. The tree that's right next to us is a Chinese fringe tree. We planted this specifically for what you see on the ends of the twigs now, the blueberries. That's a fantastic a amount of fruit. great food source for birds. So the way that I've worked this is I've created the environment around the deck and particularly around the seat where I do most of my photography. Uh, I took up photography about two years after I started developing the garden because so much was happening, I couldn't capture it right. with just binoculars. So what we did is bought a nice swivel chair, which you can see it's inside here. Oh, check out I his can camera. open these windows and I can sit in that chair for breakfast and for lunch and anytime I want to just relax with that camera. So what I've learned to do is to set the stage on the deck to bring birds in close. So I don't even need a camera to look at these, but I do photograph them. But what happens here is a trick I've learned is water is the magic element in any garden. For a birder, that is the thing that will bring birds whether you feed them or not they'll come to water. Okay. So I added a little deck water feature here, which I call it a water feature in a box. I bought it at Lowe's <laughs> yeah. for $50. And it's three gallons reservoir, trinkles like this all day long. I put a heater for the winter, so it runs all the time. And what you see around it is the decoration I've learned how to close in the garden water with shrubbery for the birds to hide in and it gives them security. So they're coming to this water source here just to drink from just it, correct? Drink. And then you've got, you've got some plants around it, and how do they okay. use those plants? Okay, so the plants are two things. This is food for the hummingbirds mm -hmm. here. This is a, a mint, and this is a uh, thing called turk's cap. Mm -hmm. okay. So the birds will come in generally from that side or from this side here and move into the water, and the trick is to put a perching stick on that birds love to perch. I call them perching right. birds. So they'll sometimes land here and go down there, drink and come back up here and just look around. So they're right there in front of me the whole time. And many of them work through the plants like the wrens. I've learned to take mealworms, throw them in the pots in the morning, and the wrens come through and feed all morning through the pots. Okay, okay. yeah. So now this is blue salvia. This mm -hmm. is for the hummingbirds. That's so a I'm, perennial salvia. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And it's, they call it uh, some narcotic hummingbirds. They <laughs> love it. They can't resist it. So it's, it's got just the right shape of, shape, of yeah. and, flower, and it's, too. And it's full of nectar. Mm -hmm. Another plant that I use quite a lot, and you'll see more of it in my garden, is this thing called a golden shrimp plant. Okay. The flower, the white part is the flower. That's also a hummingbird magnet works very well. Now, that's a tropical plant, so I bring those in in the winter and then put them back out in the spring. I keep six in the house. So everything you see here is geared to bring birds in close. So when I learned how to feed birds, I was putting out what they called a buffet. A lot of bird food. Right, well that's what you would think. Lots yeah. of bird food would bring lots of birds. No. Here's the lesson <laughs> I learned. Treat feeding. No more buffets. Let me show you how I do this. Let's start with these. 
This is a feeder I designed. It's for titmouse, chickadees, small woodpeckers, and nuthatches. It's shelled peanuts. The top on it keeps the blackbirds from getting on it. They can't get to this and eat all the food. Okay. Only the little birds can get on this. This one a friend gave me for Christmas about five years ago. That's for peanuts in the shell. That's for blue jays. I put a handful in a day. Don't fill it. Mm -hmm. When they eat the top part out, what stays in the bottom, the little birds come and peck from underneath and get their share. So all the titmouse, chickadees, things like that. Then one I'm really proud of is this one. This is called a suet feeder. It's recycled Christmas tree. It's made out of the trunk of the tree, mm -hmm. which we put the tree out in the yard for the winter, for birds to have shelter. So I drill a hole in the bottom up to about three inches, another hole about an inch here. This is an inch and a half. Put the suet in one ball a day. Roll it up, I make my own. Okay. Stick it in there, it drops to the bottom as you see it right there. The only birds that can eat that are the ones that can hang upside down. Blue jays can't get this, blackbirds, grackles, all those cannot feed off of this. Only my good birds get so to go to this. So you've put a lot of research into what kind of birds can hang upside down. I'm an and, engineer. Right, there right. we go. Uh, you've engineered that. <laughs> I'm an engineer. It's called test and modify. There okay? we go. So I've learned, and the advantage I've had really is being able, being retired, mm -hmm. I can sit here for hours at a day. I can observe birds for long periods of time and see how they behave, how they feed. That's what I've adapted to. So the other one is another suet feeder hanging out there. That's mainly for the woodpecker. Red belly woodpeckers, downies, they love that one. And what what makes it so attractive to them? It's out in the open, it's easy to get to, and what's amazing, they don't have to land on the side to get to it. They'll come sailing in, grab that thing, and it just starts swinging. And it's amazing how they adapt to feeders. Once they learned it's there, they come regularly every day. And I put one ball in at a time. When it's gone, that's it. That's it. Okay. So, so you're you're plan then is to make the feeders a little more tricky so they really have to stick around to... You got it. It's called posing for photographing. So another thing to keep in mind, a lot of people ask me, how do you handle squirrels? Right. And here's the theory. Squirrels are territorial. A squirrel will move into an area and there will be four or five will take over an area and defend it. Once you learn to outsmart that group, you've got it made. So I've learned what to do. Hanging the feeders from the gutter is number one on a thin line. Number two, sometimes they'll jump onto here. We we'll start swinging. They let go right? because it's too small. Mm -hmm. Okay, They can't reach that one out there. That's too far for them to, to, to risk it. This one, they'll jump on and come down the line, but they don't know where the food is. So it's camouflage for them. They I can see. smell it, but they can't find it. So this is the way I do squirrel proofing. Okay. okay, now let me show you another modification to a feeder that has really been a treat for me. This is what I call my entertainment feeder. Okay, this is it here. You notice it's a tube feeder. It was a thistle feeder. Right. What I did is I took the perches off because I learned if the perches are the squirrels can hang on it. Okay. So I take the perches off, nothing to hold on to other than to grip it. When they're gripping, they can't eat, okay? So the holes I made bigger for sunflowers, so I fill that once a day with sunflowers, and the way I squirrel-proofed it the other way, you notice it's on a, a rack, mm -hmm. and it's about 10 foot off, 12, 20 foot off the ground, okay? So what I do, I just reach out here like this, because I'm long arm, I can reach it, put the feet in like so, and what you see on top are automobile funnels. Oh yeah, I can see that now. Okay, so I turned them upside down. When the guy comes up to the top and slides down, he hits that first one. He can't grab this one, he hits the ground. So they don't do that but once. So this is my squirrel proofing technique here. And it That's is wonderful. entertaining to watch. So the question I usually get, how do birds feed on this? No perches, Right. Okay. they hover. They'll sit here and line up on the deck on these posing sticks on that tree and fly back and forth, get a seed, land and eat it. Sometimes they carry it off a little ways. There'd be sometimes 10, 12 birds here at a time. 
feeding. Oh, wonderful. But they're not fighting each other for the food. They're taking turns to get it. Now the woodpeckers don't take turns. They get the seed, everybody moves out of the way. So let me ask you this question. Yeah. So if I wanted to start feeding birds, and you know, you've got suet feeders, you've got peanuts, you've got all of these different options. Is it better to um, see what kind of birds are around and then go buy the food for that type of bird? Or is it better to just decide what type of bird you want to attract and then buy the food? Most of your, what I call them resident birds, which are your woodpeckers, your downies, nuthatches, uh, cardinals, blue jays, things that are local to most of the areas in people's mm -hmm. backyard, will always eat sunflower seeds. So that's okay. the start. That would be my first choice. Okay. Then go to suet, because birds will eat suet, particularly the winter time. Suet gives them a lot of energy, so they're very anxious. They'll get a seed, but they'll always go to the suet and pick that early in the mornings. Then the peanuts, that's just like dessert. So the other thing you see here are logs, posts, all around the deck. Those are to bring the birds in in a natural way. Woodpeckers love to land on a tree, so there's the post. That's what's hanging up over there. That's what this mm -hmm. is. So the woodpeckers generally will come in and land there. Then they'll go to the feeder. A lot of the little birds will land on this, hide in there, and then go get a seed. So everything's geared to give them a natural environment right. to come into. So you recommend if you're going to put out feeders, making sure there's a perch nearby yes. and water nearby yes. so for them. The extension to my feeders by my window are these feeders here, same thing, suet feeder, same thing, just a log. Sometimes I find them on the street, make the suet feeder out of them. Then the, this is a little bit bigger peanuts that are shelled. That Blue Jays can have some of these. Then the one down there is a refurbished birdhouse made into a pecan feeder. I'll show oh, wow. you how this works. I took the bottom out of the birdhouse and put wire on it. I put in three halves of pecans a day through this hole. They drop to the bottom. The only way the birds can eat that is to hang upside down. Black birds won't do that. Right. Blue jays won't do that. So I get the beautiful little birds here. Right. Right there. Blue jays on this one, woodpeckers on this one, and all the cute little birds on that one. The first, the first winter that I retired, I built this water feature. I call it a natural water feature because I use natural stone okay. and then put around it an array of plants to hide it for birds to have security to come in. And I selected specific plants for this. Small mondo grasses to give me a base to work from to set the stage for it. Then I put in some maples, some evergreens, Japanese maples. But this is a key one right here. This is a ball cypress. When birds migrate across the gulf in the spring, this is one of the first trees they see because the swamps are full of them. Oh, right. When mm -hmm. they come here, they say, oh, ball cypress. They land right there. The bottom is a little deep, so I put stones in it. Okay. They land on the stones. Then it goes through a little place here and it's making noise. They can hear this up in the tops of these trees around their house. We can't hear it, but they can. They also can see it moving. It's called syncylation because the water grows down, it reflects light. So that's what you see going down there. So the birds now land there, they land over there. That tree is a Don Redwood. You know okay. how big that will get? Like a couple, like a hundred feet or so at least? Feet. Yeah. It grows six foot a year, <laughs> and I cut it off every year. And then it back, same way with the ball cypress. Remember mm -hmm. I cut it off? That's one year's growth, right there. But it's got very sturdy stems, which I suppose it makes for good perches. It does. Right? Actually, and then the, and ev the evergreens here would, you know, provide them a little shelter and protection in the That's winter right. too, That's right? right. You know, all, this, all this in here is sheltered for them. And it keeps the hawks from getting them. That's the danger, Cooper's right. hawks. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got these uh, Dawn Redwoods, and that's just a treat to have. There's another one to this side. So how long has this Dawn Redwood been here? That's been there five years. This is one's it, six, it, six years. That's five, and one down there is five years. I love now, the look my of bottom it. is mail order. Mm -hmm. From the West Coast, they come dry-rooted. I just 
stuck them in the ground. So I built in, initially, this was all grass until last year. Oh, right. This mm -hmm. is the first year we planted it this way because I had nice grass. But what happened is the trees became big and mm -hmm. sh shaded the grass and it died. It right. was fescue, mm -hmm. or, or, I'm sorry, zoysia. It wouldn't grow. But what I had to learn to do was to control water. And so I did a lot of thinking about how to stop erosion. And you do that by terracing one way. So let me step back over here and I'll show you how this works. You can see the level is tapering down. Our yard drops all the way from the street down about a 15 degree slope. So what I've learned to do is terrace everything as I move down in the garden to slow down the movement of the water. Right. Okay. To prevent the erosion. And the erosion. And then I've learned also that if I use ground bark like this, this mm -hmm. is uh, oak, ground right. up oak, as opposed to pine bark, pine bark will float. This will not. The water runs over it, so it doesn't erode away. It stays there. Is it partly the water erodes over it more because this is more of a shred and so and it, it kind of mats together? Got it. That's exactly right. Whereas it, the pine bark it, is more like nuggets that it, it float. just floats. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this stays right there. So all I have to do then to channel the water is to get a little low spot coming off of there where your foot is around through right. there and it goes right down through there and I'll show you how I take care of it when I get down to the gate. Okay. Now, so what you see here just looking through the garden, this way you see a lot of density. This is the key for developing an environment that is safe for birds. Their main enemy in an environment like this, particularly where you're feeding, are cooper's hawks. They will catch the birds and eat them. So all this density here is designed for floral look, for the beauty. You look at the bees on this now, it's butterflies in the summertime for the flocks. All these plants in here are geared some way to attract bees, pollinators, and hummingbirds. Then in the density as you move through the garden, I keep the same theme going, density everywhere, even from the ground to the tops of the trees is the key. You want to have a continual movement of density so the birds can come in, come down to the ground, move back up, and never have to expose themselves. Right. In this open area, he's vulnerable, so they'll stay in the They've learned. They'll stay in there. You can see them. They're poking through. But there's a lot of food in here of insects. What? Yeah, that's like what I was going to say. At what point do these pretty little pollinators become lunch? <laughs> uh, well, the bees aren't so much bad, but what's on the inside there are a lot of grasshoppers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, larvae from moths and, and butterflies, and that's what they'll be eating on. So, uh, Is there um, a specific time of the year when uh, they're you see them feeding more on berries versus insects? Yes. Or okay, it starts out in the spring. As soon as the growth comes out on the trees, bugs get on it. So when the warblers come through, the migrating birds that come through every spring and then go back in the fall, they're insect eaters. They'll feed at the tops of the trees. The trick with water that I'm going to show you is to bring them down to the ground in the open. Water will do that. But they're going to get their food up there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll find them down in here. They're the ground birds like towhees, brown thrashers, mockingbirds will come down into here and feed. But the warblers stay up higher. So you really got to bait them you gotta down bait here. Them. You've got to <laughs> set the stage right. for it. And shallow water is the, another key for that. Okay. Okay? So from a standpoint of erosion and conservation of soil, what I've done is my driveway is designed to take the water off my house, up into the street, my neighbors the same way, and I've built channels down each side of the yard right. and took them now through the fence and built a channel along the fence and put them into a dry creek bed, which we'll see in just a few moments. So if you look down here, everything is geared now to have no erosion. Right. All the water here runs around this way, runs towards the fence and then down the side and I stoned it in so it's real pleasant right. to look at. Let me uh, explain a few more water feature keys to you because once I learned this, it became very valuable for me to know where to look for birds. Now remember, I'm sitting up there in a chair with my camera. From that position, 
sitting in that chair, I can see three water features and all of these trees. Okay, so all of this in here, all these trees you see are for hiding. Right. Okay? Birds come down from up there, they'll appear right here, and I'll never know they're here until they pop out on that water. So they use the trees as cover until they're ready that's to get exactly a drink right. and then they come back they move to back that cover. It, that's exactly the way it works. Mm -hmm. And you'll see why in a minute. And uh, You may see some. They're coming through right now. But uh, here's a good example of the way I'm doing this. This is a common pedestal water feature. Terry and I bought this 46 years ago when we moved here. It's been in our yard all this time. I never knew the value of it until I learned to use cover. Once I learned that, right. bang, that's become the main place. I get more birds here than I can get in my big one right now. So there's my perching sticks. Mm -hmm. All this is geared for the birds to sit and land on. They come out of here, sticks, looking, waiting. There's a big bird in there. They'll wait like a robin. Mm -hmm. So they line up. I've had as many as five migrating birds called, uh, in this case, they're, they're uh, Red-eyed vireos, there's a whole, whole group of them uh, that come through here. I noticed that you've got a little drip ah, coming down. Good, good <laughs> observer. Now, what you're seeing there is something I just added on this fall. I'm going to show you where I moved it from. This is a new feature that you're seeing. So I hit it in the trees. It drips down here. So now it stays full all the time. I do this only in the summer. In the winter, it'll freeze, mm -hmm. so I can't do this. Right. But in the summer, that is a magnet. That little ripple of water seems to attract them better. But somehow, the birds find this water, and I do not know how it is they do it. And I've had, like the last two days, I had wood thrush come in here. Mm -hmm. A wood thrush is a forest bird. has nothing to do in the urban environments. They want to be in the woods. There he sits, drinking. Water. Okay. So one one quick question: Do you ever you said you keep it like that in the summer? Is there any mosquito issues or no, anything? No, because I have to clean it sometimes twice a day. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the birds poop in it. Okay. Okay. That's the downside of this feature. Right. So my technique is I have a, a, a brush, a fairly large brush, and I can just take and scrape it out to the side, and I have a pail when I get it fairly clean. I just put new water in it, and that's it. Sometimes I do that twice a day. Thank you. What is this little thing? It looks Ooh, like a camera, maybe? That little thing is a new experiment that we're doing. That's a security camera for the house. Mm -hmm. Okay, I figured out we could put that down here and see it. You're spying okay. on the birds. Um, here's this morning. Wood thrush. Oh, yeah. It's, it's dark. Still mm -hmm. dark. Yeah, it's dark. That wood thrush is sitting on that feeder at... Uh, 6.33, and I'm asleep, <laughs> so I got him. But you still got to got see him. <laughs> but he came back later, and I got him with the real camera, okay? So you see the density taken through here, and then as you as you look through here, you can still see the pathways working here for the densities. The trees above me now have gotten mature, so we've grown into this environment. Right. It's just working well, very well. Every garden is, you know, ever-changing, so you're yeah. always growing and changing yeah. to something new. Okay, so this garden started in 2004, and that's what you see here. This yard you see is this island was this year's the first year this has been here. Planted again with flowers and things for density, but for enjoyment. There's the shrimp plant for hummingbirds.